Me justice, everyone. Welcome to First Foods. My name is Desiree Kane. I'm a Miwok Two Spirit living here in Arapahoe Territory. We just want to welcome everyone to First Foods, a program and made for Indigenous people and our allies who are ready for a new day for old ways. We'd like to thank our partner, Ibex Puppetry, for the ongoing support as we build this program that makes critical knowledge available from the culture bearers that hold the oldest knowledge on the continent, something so many of us need at this time. So today, our panel is on um, breast milk as food sovereignty and bodily autonomy. <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Brooke uh, Kiahani from uh, Taino, living in Matinak, welcoming everybody back to First Foods. Ray has said that we are covering breast milk uh, as food sovereignty and also bodily autonomy of you know the indigenous body. So thank you very much for coming, and we'll be reviewing the protocols or not. This no. Okay, so we'll go right into it. Um, just wanted to introduce our, our lovely, beautiful grandmother, matriarch, Christinia uh, from the Lakota communities. So, Christinia. Oh, hi, Brooke. Thank you. Um, I'm really, I'm really uh, happy and excited to be here tonight. I watched everybody's videos and oh my gosh, let me tell you what, this was a dynamite panel. Really, really deeply informative. And um, uh, when, I, when I was watching it, of course, I went back to my days of pregnancy, you know, the pre-pregnancy and, and, and my, the, my birthing process. And of course, what I, what I thought about was, you know, the elders that came before me and, oh, I, I can't go into that right now, but I will eventually <laughs> during this, this <laughs> panel. Anyway, I want to welcome and uh, Rayanne Madison. I really, really enjoyed uh, your presentation, as well as yours, Phoenix, You're two, you were two of my favorite presenters besides Takati. <laughs> uh, did you catch that? That was pretty clever. Oh, okay, <laughs> Rianne, what I was, <laughs> what I wanted to say to you is, <clears throat> I absolutely loved that your presentation was full of historical and ancestral life ways of your people, the Anishinaabe, and. Um, I really, really enjoyed that. And I was wondering um, if you could tell us some more about, um, let's see, uh, the, the lessons during the birthing process. We say it's important to be present. Um, is, that the, is that for the, like the doula or that uh, everybody that's involved has to be present in order to have a successful birth? Thank you, Christina. I really appreciate that acknowledgement and, and affirmation. Hearing that from you as our elder really means a lot to me. And I think that the, you know, the, I, I like this idea of being present. And then I also have a, a student who has been through uh, several of my online classes and, and someone who's really special to me who has really helped me change the way I think about embodiment and presence because that sometimes has sort of a, a, a like a colonial way of thinking of how to be present in a situation because she reminds me that sometimes for a BIPOC folks to be present means that we are actually in the ancestor realm or that we are able to fluidly move between our body here on earth and the ceremony that we're participating in. And so to be present in this ceremony of birth, I think that means that we have surrendered ourselves through our oh, preparation okay. for the birthing ceremony to be, to be in that in-between space um, I might have 
talked about it in my presentation uh, two weeks ago, but I, I think that we talked about this in-between world or this realm that kind of exists between where our babies are coming from and where we are here, you know, standing or laying, however it is that we're birthing. If you listen to Tikarima teach, she says that it's squatting, you know, so we're squatting mm -hmm. down to grab the baby. But we're also in this in-between space where we're literally on like the threshold of of death really it is the it is the convergence of our life here and the veil to that other side that spirit realm it goes away it, it disappears for that ceremony of birth and it really gets very thin and and um we're able to cross that boundary in other forms of ceremony to even something as simple as laying out your tobacco or smudging and so to me to be present for that ceremony just means that we're, we're we're surrendering to that experience and empowerment to me comes from the ability to really just lean into that and uh, to know that when we come back on the other side that we have to stay here and that's where we can spend a lot of time talking about those practices including the the giving of milk to our babies uh, mm -hmm. and the traditional foods to the birthing and postpartum person. Mm -hmm. um, there was, a, you did so much and you did it so well. And, you know, and besides the historical and ancestral life ways uh, context that you told your story in, the thing that I loved, which is important for us elders sometimes, is that you, you recapped frequently. You know, you said, okay, so now we've talked about, and then you'll go over that, and then you'll say, and now, and I, that really, I think that, that's what I liked, uh, so I liked so much about, about your presentation, but that was really important to me, for you to recap, you know, um, and, and then bring, bring us up to speed, and then present for a while. And then you're moving on to something else. So you recap again. That's a really good technique. Very, very helpful. And I don't think I'm the only elder who feels that way about things like this. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm the, I am the first woman in my matrilineal uh, history that wasn't put in boarding school from the time I was, you know, able to start school. My mother went to boarding school, <clears throat> St. Francis Indian School in Rosebud. My grandmother, uh, my grandmother went to, um, what is the one that starts with a C? Carlisle. And then the, the, the elder before her, oh, I knew I would forget. I didn't write it down either. But anyway, so a lot of the traditional beauty of the whole process of carrying a child and preparing for childbirth um, was, wasn't something that they handed down to me. And it was just something um, that I somehow innately knew because when it was time for me to, to, to give birth, um, I'm so afraid. I, my parents never took us to, uh, rarely on rare occasions, uh, took us to uh, a Western doctor. You know, my father was from the Philippine Islands, and he did a lot of our traditional, a lot of traditional healing. Um, and so, and my mother, having come from boarding school, didn't believe in any of the stuff that you presented. And um, so when I had my children, I was so afraid of Western medicine. I said, no, I, I'm going to have this baby natural. Uh, because I really don't know how what you're you're doing to me is going to affect my body and my ability to give the best present or the best birthing process possible. And I don't know what your Western medicine, if it can seep into my baby somehow, and I just don't want any of it. So I had four children. I delivered them all naturally, and I breastfed all of them. And my mother was appalled. <laughs> <laughs> and I really, that's really heartbreaking to me that that's what, you know, the, the, the dominant society has done to indigenous people, you know, around the world. So it really made me feel happy that, 
you know, that a lot of the stuff that I experienced, I think was an innate part of me um, that went through that, that went through that, uh, or made me go through the process that, that I chose, but I still wasn't allowed to squat. And I still had to be in a hospital. But back in those days, I mean, doulas and, and stuff like that in the larger dominant world, um, it really, they really didn't like midwives. There was a lot of, and this was back in the 70s. There was a lot of fuss from hospitals and doctors about doulas and stuff. So I just want you to know that how much that was appreciated. And I would like you to, uh, if you could, recap for me um, about the, um, oh, okay, the first latch on of breastfeeding. Um, the, I, I like what you said about uh, it, it's, the baby is getting an immunization that preserves integrity, integrity of its gut lining. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Of the big gut lining? Yep. Okay. And the thing that, that I like as well, equally as well, is that it has a positive impact on dental health as well, the baby's dental health. And that's probably why I wear dentures. I was not breastfed. <laughs> but I love it. You, you pointed out so many incredible things in all inclined towards spirituality in, in the whole process. And I'll tell you, and I share this with all young women uh, that have been up and around the project that I work on, on Pine Ridge, that have had babies, and I hold them, and I said, you may not believe it, but this baby and I are exchanging information right now because they just come from where I'm going to be heading to soon. And and they go, what? I said, well, yeah, you know, here they are, brand new. And they're telling me what, what I can expect over there. You know, how nice it is and good. And I'll see all my relatives. So I like that you brought that forward, too. But um, I would like you to recap the, the part that you talked about when you said when you place a newborn on the mother's belly, how it can wiggle up. Uh, to the breast because the sense of smell is so strong. Uh, can you recap that a little bit for me? Yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, you got me feeling all emotional <laughs> talking oh. about, the, the, about the, you know, we call it in our language, the Anji King, the land of everlasting happiness. And, and it just really brings a smile to my face to know that our babies just came from that side and, Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of them, they are brand new to this world and some of them may have been here before and some of them may be here many, many times before. So we always say that they're returning elder or returning ancestor. Uh, and sometimes people outside our culture don't understand why we say that. So I appreciate that story that you shared. Uh, really brought a little tear to my eye um, but yeah so babies they are really um, they're, they're very powerful they have a lot of not only spiritual abilities but innate physiologic abilities that they're born with and in in most cases in particular when we have you know a gentle physiologically normal mammalian birth those innate abilities are switched on right away and our our babies come sort of preloaded with all of these great things that allow them to do what they need to do to survive via this extra gestational experience through this attachment to their birthing parent meaning that it's almost like how kangaroos keep their joeys in the pouch for so long because they're still growing on the outside but they're not ready to go out into the world they can't jump right into life on the outside of their birthing parent and our babies are like that too so it is this balance between, you know, they're very fragile and vulnerable and it's our responsibility to take care of them. And it's, and it's quite an intense experience to do that, but they're not as fragile as we think. And they come with a lot of really amazing abilities to help themselves survive. And one of those ways that they do that 
uh, as part of our mammalian nature is that they are able to find their way to the breast and it's through the senses that they're born with, uh, including the sense of sight, the scent, their, their vision isn't uh, super developed at birth. You know, they can't see things um, past a certain distance. They're, they're mostly nearsighted, uh, but they have this ability to see very well up close in particular high contrast shapes and colors. And so uh, for those of us who are like, you know, light to medium to even dark complected, we'll notice certain changes happening at the very end of the pregnancy. And then when the baby is born, we'll notice in most uh, birthing people that, you know, we have this line that forms between our pubic bone and the belly button. And uh, I think it's called like the linea negra. And it's like just this brown or black line that is a shoop all the way up to the belly button. And then also the nipples and the areola become darker. They may even grow in size. And so this is sort of like the map for that baby. If they are looking for high contrast shapes and colors, then they've already got an advantage because our body has provided this map for them. And so they are able to do what's called the breast crawl right after birth, where if they're placed on the belly, they can, using their sense of sight, following that roadmap, and using their sense of touch and their sense of smell, uh, they're able to search for and identify the scent of their birthing parents' areolas, which actually are excreting a substance that smells very similar, we believe, to the, the scent of the amniotic fluid. And so they're finding that familiar smell, and they're also searching through their hearing for the sound of their parents' voice. You know, they can hear in the womb, uh, they can recognize and differentiate voices, and so they very much know what their person sounds like. So they're following all of those clues to be able to latch themselves without interruption in a, in a gentle and respectful environment, uh, they are able to latch themselves within the first hour. And this is all in, of course, ideal situation, but this isn't to say that if a baby didn't get that first hour, you know, to latch themselves that it, breastfeeding is ruined and that the ceremony never happened. That's not true. You know, they can always latch mm -hmm. afterwards but we're always just striving towards uh, a more peaceful and respectful entrance for them into the world, no matter what environment their family chooses to or is able to birth in. And so they're able to do that breast crawl and, and you can literally watch them do, 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 up to the breast and, and, it, and it's such a, uh, a, a gentle, you know, if, if you had respect for the birthing person and the baby, it, you wouldn't want to interrupt that time. You know, we see a lot of chaos in the birthing space. We see a lot of, you know, we want to scrub the baby. We want to, uh, you know, start the uh, examining of them and, and we're pushing and pulling and there's monitors and there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, but when we step away from that and just view it for this experience that it is intended to be in nature, you know, we wouldn't go up to a kangaroo and like open the pouch and pull like the little tiny <laughs> joey out. Yeah, um, so yeah. it's kind of going back to that natural, you know, what it, it what original teachings exist uh, in order to preserve the, the innate abilities of of that baby, you know, because we, so, we want to say something. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So um, when I had my daughter, I did not have no latching experience. She did not latch at all because I had a I had a C section, and um, what happened with that? My story for my birth was um, I had gone to a hospital and because I was told that you're supposed to make a birth plan and stuff like this see I didn't have no no family no maternal nothing to help me with my my pregnancy I didn't there's I have no family to to guide me through anything on on that so I was just literally only going by you know what 
community members told me, what my friends and, and their relatives were telling me, you know? And um, uh, my in-laws were very, because um, my, my daughter's father is not native. Um, my in-laws were very, um, they didn't want anything to, they didn't want to help me with nothing or talk to me about nothing about the pregnancy. They didn't have anything to do with it, they, you know? Um, so when I, when I went in, because I was told I need to make a birth plan, I need to go to the hospital for a birth plan. And the one thing I had was, I didn't have my period, by the way, for like, how many years? Uh, they, they diagnosed me with early um, amenorrhea, you know, lack of a, lack of a period. Um, I, I just didn't have it. I, I didn't have a reason for it. There was nothing wrong with me hormonally. Everything was fine. And then just like that, I got pregnant. And um, it was confusing for me because I didn't have a period. So I didn't know when I conceived. We had to go off of the, the HCG count and, and the size to guesstimate like conception. So they guessed her conception in, um, at a, at septem in a September, end of September. You know, and that was guesstimated by, you know, the first hospital I had gone to. Well, toward the end of my pregnancy, I was like, okay, I got to make a birth plan. Everybody told me to go make a birth plan. So I went to the hospital, another hospital, a cheaper one, because I, I needed something I could afford. And, you know, I don't live uh, in the States right now. So, uh, you know, I had to go somewhere else. And um, it was horrible. I went in for just to get, have a birth plan, I gave them my, my ultrasounds and I gave them my, um, my conception date, you know, the whatever paperwork I had from the first hospital I went to. And um, when I gave it to them, you know, they decided to do another ultrasound. And then they decided, they asked me about my conception. And I said, well, it's on, this, it's on this date. You know, this is what they came with, delayed conception on this date. And they told me, no. We think you got your period. You, we think you got pregnant in August, or you know, the very beginning of August, or um, the very end of a July. And I said the size of the ultrasound and the you know the the HCG count it puts it at the right age. So you 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 know I, I didn't get pregnant earlier. And they were like, no no no, you're forty weeks. So it's time for you to to be induced. And I was like. No, and then um, because the, the country I'm in is very um, patriarchal, so you have to, um, they get permission from the father to, to um, hospitalize you. And when the husband gives a permission, it doesn't matter what the woman says at all, you can't do anything about it. So they told him we need to induce her, she's over. And he said, okay, the hospital is gonna do this to you. And their doctors, they know what they're talking about. I said, no, 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 this is not time. It's not even near time. And um, they started inducing me. And it took after about on the third, on the second day, they popped my water, manually popped my water. And they, on the fourth day, I told them, you need to cut her out already. On the fifth day at 10 p.m., they, took me in for, um, you know, the, the C-section. And for the C-section, um, they put me to sleep for it because they didn't give me anesthesia at first. Like they had installed the, the spinal tap in your back, but as soon as they installed it, they didn't wait for the anesthesia to hit. They asked me, can you move your legs? And I scissor kicked like this. And then they grabbed my ankles and they, tied it to the bed and I tied my arms out like that. And they put the they put the curtain and I said, I just moved my legs, I just kicked you. And then I, I felt the cold thing like they were wiping me. And then they started cutting and I started screaming. And then um, I, it was just the worst, I don't know. I don't know a pain like that, it's just really bad pain. And then you feel something cold and hard like going in you and you feel like this cold pain, like this, like a freezing pain. I think it must've been the air touching inside of me or something. And I was screaming and then my blood pressure started going down and they told her, give her something to shut her up. And then they injected something into me and then I don't remember anything. And when I woke up, I was uh, in a recovery area. And I said, where's my, where's my baby? Where's my daughter? 
they were like, oh, she's, she's, in, the, she's in the birthing room. And I, I said, um, I want her. And they said, no, not right now. You can get her tomorrow. And then um, they, they pushed me into a recovery area. It was a, mat, it was a ward that had like 50 beds in it. And it had different mothers who gave birth in different ways you know, there. We were separated by curtains in between. And um, I, I needed help getting up because I wanted to go to the bathroom, but I couldn't get up. I couldn't feel anything because they had given me so much anesthesia while I was sleeping, that spinal tap, that um, I couldn't feel from here down. And then every time I went to sleep, I would stop breathing. So then they had to give me something to counteract it and I had to stay awake otherwise, because every time I went to sleep, I stopped breathing, you know? And that's how, that was pretty bad. So when I finally, um, it was bad. You know, when they took out the catheter, they did it like that and, went, and it popped out and it was, it was painful, it was bad. I just had an overall bad birth experience, you know? And I needed help walking still. I asked the nurse to help me walk. She said, get over it. Everybody gives birth. You're not special. And then she, she left. And I, I, I tried to get up. And when I started walking, I literally, like a slug, I left a trail of blood on the floor to the bathroom. And it, the bathroom was maybe 50, 20, 25, 30 feet away from me, you know? And I was just like walking really slowly. And there's blood getting on the floor. And there's like all these 50 women around me and just like, they're like, what's wrong with her? Like she never had a baby before, you know? And it was just bad. It was a horrible experience. And when I got my daughter finally, you know, the next day, I think it, I think maybe 24 hours had passed by the time I had my daughter. Um, she wouldn't latch. She she didn't uh, she didn't really respond to me, you know. Um, I tried. I kept on trying, you know, try and she wouldn't, you could put the nipple in her mouth. She didn't know what to do with it. You know, it was like, like nothing, you know, she didn't respond to anything. Yeah. But then again, um, she also didn't cry either. Um, she just laid in her bed. She was a quiet baby, but she was 1.7 kilos because she was born early and her skin was red, like a red M&M, you know? And she was so thin, you know, like she had no fat on her body. I told them that it was too early and that they're changing my conception date. It's bad. But she came out, they cut her out. She was, I don't how many pounds is 1.7 kilos? It's uh maybe three, three point something pounds. But she could breathe, so that was good. They didn't even put her on machines or nothing, <laughs> which is good that she could breathe. And it was crazy when I finally got first got her by the way so that I could try to see my baby they made me walk down the hallway to go get her and when I went the nurse was holding her by her legs like a chicken and washing her in a sink and the water was going on her face and I was so mad I said my daughter's not a chicken you know and they're like how do you know it's your daughter I said because she's the only red one there like and she was like the size of a doll you know and I was just crazy. I didn't have this kind of good birthing experience, no matriarchs or anybody to talk to, just kind of put it together based off of my, my own um, education. And then of course, off of people's else, other people's experiences, you know? So I just had to give her formula. And then what I started to do was um, just pump. And now I made a lot of breast milk. So I pumped a lot, um, but I gave her with, with a bottle because she just never, ever, ever like, she, I guess she got used, I feel she got lazy. Like she got used to the bottle, like automatically giving the milk. It's like, she didn't want to suck. But when you gave her the bottle, she would drink it. I hope that makes um, sense. Phoenix, uh, I'm really happy that you, not happy that this happened to you, but I'm, mm -hmm. it's really important that we talk about birth trauma and patriarchy and these types of things that happen. Mm -hmm. um, I was told it was called, it's called birth rape when they totally it is ignore rate. everything, everything that you say and everything that you ask mm -hmm. and they just, uh, just do whatever they want. I was, I was trying to find a word for it because it's very traumatic, you know? I'm, I actually, I'm kind of surprised I held it together, you know, telling it right now. Um, it, it is, it is rape. Remember? It is part of rape culture. It's part of misogyny and patriarchy and 
um, a long history of, of just quite frank uh, colonization and, and birth spaces. Um, and I just, because you're saying that, and if there are other people from the community listening in who weren't able to have, you know, a safe birth space, because they don't consider rape uh, birth spaces safe at all, you know, they're just not. Um, I just want people to know that we are not ableist, we are not classist, and we are not um, sexist, and we're also not a uh, homophobic or queerphobic space. If you are unable to breastfeed because you have decided to remove your breast, that is fine. That is your bodily autonomy. If you are unable to breastfeed because, you know, something is similar, um, me and, and I didn't have such a severe situation as Phoenix, but um, my child was also premature. And premature babies do have a tendency to not have a rooting response or suckling response. So a rooting response, um, essentially, and I, uh, is if I put something here to a child, they automatically go like that, no matter what it is. And that's called a rooting response. And the suckling response is if you put something in their mouth, they'll, so that's the suckling response. Premature babies tend to not have that. So bottle feeding is really good because you're able to place the bottle and help them manually. Because for, for Hathway, um, I didn't get to, he didn't really get to nurse until about his second or third month of, of being born in, in, in this world. Um, so with that, it, it's, it's okay. You know, it's okay to bottle feed. It's okay to breastfeed. It's okay to formula feed. Um, there's no judgments in this space here. It's hard enough being a mom. So I just really wanted to run it home. I know a lot of times in birth work, uh, natural birth work and in hospital birth work, they tend to use patriarchal speech or very uh, ableist speech or classist speech. I don't think we're, they tend to do that on purpose, but we still need to be mindful of that. And I just want to put it out there that we support parents, birthing persons, mothers, we support you guys. And just like with Phoenix's story, like I don't want another sister out there to feel left alone or unheard or to go through this type of trauma and feel like, damn, like I, I'm supposed to be doing these things naturally or why isn't my child suckling? Because that's a very hard thing for, I don't know, but I know probably Rayanne and also Christina and Phoenix can talk to having a child and being worried about something as basic as feeding and making, especially your first child, you don't know if you're doing things right. And then in Phoenix's case, to have someone have such a patriarchal rape culture, rape birth culture experience is just awful. And just Phoenix, thank you for being such a powerful uh, matriarch, a, a powerful Apache mom, and a, just a powerful voice for women, uh, just in general. I just really appreciate you and I, I I just want to thank you for being here. Thanks. Um, so about the breast milk. So I I, bre I did pump and I made a lot of milk for maybe three months or so. And then after that, you know, the stress with what I was going through, because I was going through a divorce, you know, the, the stress, um, just like that, I went to bed. One day I was pumping like so much milk from each breast and then I went to bed, I woke up next day, there was no more milk and it just dried up. And then everything I did, nothing herbal, nothing I did works because I know it is the stress from what was I going through that, um, that got in the way. But then I, then I switched to, to formula and then I had, you know, all those issues that come with um, switching, you know, so, you know, trying to find the right formula. And because I, th I think it's because she was so early that she had a problem swallowing, you know, just like, it's like she wasn't swallowing properly. Like I had to give her a formula that was thicker, you know, to, to keep, so she, she could keep it down. And that lasted maybe two, two months, two, three months. And then it went away. Hmm. Well, that, oh gosh, that was such a traumatic experience to go to little sister. And I'm really, really feeling bad that you had to experience um, something that should have been really sacred. And I know, but, but I know that somewhere inside of you, it was so sacred. While you were talking, I was thinking about something that Rayanne said. Um, and, it, and, 
and I think it was wonderful. This lactose, is it lactogenesis? Um, and I, I guess it was something that was written by one of your friends, Rayanne, by Jennifer, name of Jennifer or something, where after birth, mom and baby support each other. And I, I was wondering if you could address that, Rayanne, and how, and how that might have. Um, I'm wondering if Phoenix was able to feel any of that. And I'm curious if you could also address Rayanne the, the disappearance of her milk overnight. Hello? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, I was muted, oh. so I wasn't sure if they wanted oh. me to stop talking. <laughs> but, you know, Phoenix, I want to just say that I, I appreciate the trust that you had in this space, and I appreciate your ancestors for moving you to share that with us and for for giving us a vision of what it really is like to one, have a C-section because we in our culture don't really know, like we think we know because of TV and movies, but we, we really don't know what C-section birth is like. And you know, we kind of have this idea that, you know, it's like a little hole and the baby just pops out you know and it's just an alternative but it, it's really a lot in the way that you describe your experience I, I work with a lot of people who have had c-sections and that and the words that you use are very similar to uh, people who have had a similar experience to you where they feel okay. the cold you know they feel they can feel the instruments they you know they, but I heard a lot of um and what I see in you is that I, I could feel that your, your spirit, your body, you know, even your breast, your womb were still leading you towards your baby, even though she did not come in the way that you may have envisioned. And so that ceremony is still complete, it's still sacred, and it's through the mystery of life, we may never understand why it happened in that way. It's something that was arranged before you and your daughter even came. Um, but it's, it, it, it is always sacred, you know, it, it always is sacred and, and just the, the act of caring for our children is sacred, even if it's not through milk, even if it's through milk and formula, I mean, it's through someone else's milk or however it looks for us. You know, we have elders who were born prematurely who had to be kept in little shoe boxes on the oven door, you know, before they even had warmers and these types of things. So that has always existed in our history and every story is important and, and it's good for us to be uh, uh, present for you as you share that and I hope you found something uh, some sort of relief in getting that story out of you I think that um, I, Chris, <laughs> Christiana, I don't even remember what your question was but I just wanted to give some love to Phoenix for uh, trusting us in in this space and talk about how sometimes in the world of birth work we speak very negatively about c-sections or of hospital birth and and it can almost veer into the realm of like well it, it c-section is not a ceremony but it is you know you still had to go to that side and get your baby you know, you still made an arrangement before you were even born that you were going to welcome the baby. You were going to bring that specific ancestor here. And, um, you know, maybe <laughs> that, that, that just is how it is, you know. And so um, it, it, I appreciate that you shared that with us. I wanted to share that because, um, you know, there's a lot of times, you know, women will go to the hospital and they will not be listened to no matter what they say. They will say, I want to squat and they will force you into a laying position. They will tell you, cause that's also what happened to me in those four days they, they were trying to be inducing me, you know, they gave me everything, the Pitocin, everything to try to induce me, you know? And I wanted to try different positions, you know? No, 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 they, they actually tied me to the bed to make me stay in the bed. I felt like I was in a psych ward, giving birth in a psych ward, you know? So like there's, you know, 
it's important, I think, if you can have people with you, because I didn't have anybody with me to help me. Because the, if you're alone, maybe, you know, you'll find out if the hospital you're in is like that very quickly. And if you're in a hospital like that and you're alone, there's not really much you can do because then it's just your voice by yourself. But if you're able to have somebody with you, even if it's even if they say family only, you can lie, say this is my sister, you know, or you know, whatever. This is my sister, you know, and let let her be there and be like, no, let her do what she wants, you know, let let her do this or that, you know, have somebody with you. So I wanted to share my story because I did research it after, and it was called. I came across like two or three articles that was titled birth rape, and it literally described the 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 loss of control or in, in the the power the power that's put on you you know all of this you know the same things that i experienced that's what it that's what it was called and maybe maybe other people watching this experience something similar maybe maybe somebody's got a doctor who seems kind of iffy you know if you have a doctor that you think is kind of iffy just run away and get a new one already that's my don't give it no chances you know, you don't want to, you don't want to go through a birth rape situation. It's literally called birth rape. Um, you know, but it was good because um, in the end, I did get my daughter. I knew something was wrong because when I got, when I went into the hospital to make that birth plan, while I was there waiting for the confirmation from the husband to, to sign the, to sign my status, um, a, do a dust storm came and like, the whole sky, everything, you know, I don't know if you've been in a dust storm in a desert before, but everything gets so red and like, you can't see through anything. It's just red orange, that's it. You look out the window, you can't even see the cars. It's just red orange. Like the whole place had a massive dust storm. And I was like, and the, even the air in the, in the waiting area I was in, it was turning cloudy. And I was like, yeah, this is not a good sign. Something's gonna happen. It's not a good sign, but she came out healthy. She came out, she could breathe. She was just so tiny, so tiny. And I'm surprised that she could breathe and all of that stuff, you know. Her hand was like, like not even like this small, you know. Yeah, I'm really happy that you shared that with us. And, and I'm also just, I've never heard that term birth rate uh, before. And that's really interesting because maybe I had some of that with my firstborn. I made it to the hospital on time, but um, I, I had a real difficult time delivering. And he came out and when I find, and I didn't get to see him. I went in on a Monday uh, and I think I didn't get to see him until Thursday because we had such a, I had such a terrible time delivering him. And when he came out, he was, I thought, I asked the doctor, why does he have freckles? I don't have freckles. And he said, and he looked again and he said, oh, that's the tiki eye. Uh, you must have, this baby must have had a really hard time passing through the birth canal. So I thought, you know, that, huh, that's really interesting. But they kept him from me because my blood pressure was going out of control. And they put me on some kind of, um, oh, I don't know what it was to control my, my, um, blood pressure and so I was planning on breastfeeding and they wouldn't even bring them to me because they said that the stuff that they were giving me to, to control blood pressure might have an effect on him so I know that yeah, feeling why... oh my gosh I wanted him to be with me from the get-go but what I wanted to say to you too Phoenix and and thanking Rayanne for for mentioning this because we're all doing here exactly what she talked about we're Right now, we're living in kinship and the community of the goddess, you know. Uh, we, ha we all are the creators of life. And um, I'm so glad now that I, I feel like we formed community and relationships right during this, this panel discussion. No, 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 no. Yeah. I wanted to say they kept my daughter from me for 24 hours because they told me that the anesthesia they gave me um, was not good for the babies, that she couldn't have any breast milk because of the anesthesia. Um, I don't know if it was the injection that made me sleep or if it was the, the spinal tap or if it was the, the thing they gave, the drip they gave to counteract it. Um, but 
something they gave me and it was like 24 hours. They didn't let her, let me have her for that. But C-sections are no joke. I mean, whew, you can't even use the bathroom. Like just trying to use, just, just go pee. It feels like, like you're gonna rip in half or something. Like, like your insides are gonna spill out across the floor. That's how bad it, literally, you feel like you like, oh my God, if I squeeze anything, you're, it's, I'm gonna be a ketchup packet, you know? So I, so what I did was I got Senna. You guys know Senna, the plant? The leaves? Yes. Yeah, so I made a senna tea and you know, it, it softened everything up. And then also it helped to pass all the gas because gas bubbles build up in the body. You know, when you get your C-section, air gets inside and then the gas bubbles kind of move underneath your skin. You know, so it ended up by my, right here by my, my neck and my shoulder, you know? And it was just sitting there, bubble. And so uh, you gotta, help your body pass that those bubbles and the and the the gas and that that it is passed from florida it is and you need <laughs> you need senna because when you have a c section even a fart you just you're crying saying oh my god just let me fart like it's just that bad <laughs> and then everybody you vaginal. can't eat anything either also for <laughs> vaginal because if you get tears like mm -hmm. I had, to, I had um second, almost third degree lacerations. It's basically towards the booty. <laughs> yes. you, you want a soft poop? You do not want to play with that. <laughs> and the other thing yeah. they don't talk about is the hemorrhoids. Okay, people, this is very serious. Yeah. You could get yeah. the, when the baby's head goes down, especially if they have you on your back. I mean, I was upset because I kept telling them I need. Even though they had uh, gave me the epidural, I kept telling them, I need to get up. I need to get up. I need to get up. Like something instinctually is like, I need to get up. And they helped me down a little bit. Um, but the baby, if you're on your back, puts a lot of pressure on your your rectum and your anus. And you get a whole bunch of uh, hemorrhoids. So hemorrhoids and tears, oh. that's just, yep. Yeah. You need soft soft stool. It's, it's no yeah. joke. You know what I, I wanted to ask about too is the um uh oh the closing out uh birthing ceremony. Uh could you address that a little bit, Rayanne? Because I think that a lot of us didn't get to experience that. I know. Oh, and one thing I wanted to say too that I wrote down when I was listening to you is that I didn't know, but the hospitals now when the mother passes the placenta, they put it in a pan, the nurse takes it somewhere, and they drain it of all the blood to use for the blood bank. Isn't that something? So, Rayanne, <laughs> could you talk just about that closing uh, birthing ceremony? Yeah, the closing is really important because every ceremony that is opened, it has to be closed. Right. And that is because we have opened that doorway to the spirit world. And if we don't close it, we say that we have one foot in the grave or we are hanging what we're ha half of us is hanging into that other side. And there are different teachings for each tribal nation, but what's common amongst all indigenous people is the closing of that birthing ceremony. And it can happen. It doesn't matter if you had a C-section, doesn't matter if you didn't breastfeed, doesn't matter if you had this going on 50 years ago or, or three years ago. Uh, it could be at any point because we're always after birth. Once we've had a birth, we're always after birth. We're always postpartum. Um, but what, what is common and something that we can all do, and it brings us back to the theme of food sovereignty, is with eating our traditional foods. So the cultural foods that come from our direct lineage, that is part of the way that we close the ceremony. Because we are people from Mother Earth. And so the, the more we, we eat from Mother Earth, the more we can become like her. Right, so the strength of all those plants, the spirit of all those plants, uh, the spirit and strength of the foods, you know, of this maize, of our wild rice, of our venison, of our bone broth, of the fish, um, all, all of the plants and the sacred herbs that uh, Phoenix has educated us about, 
those are the way that we close the ceremony because that is the way that we ground ourselves, literally ground ourselves in this realm so that our foot's no longer hanging in that other realm. Uh, the way that we do that is by giving our body a reminder of who we are and where we come from. So this, this idea of food sovereignty, even beyond breast milk, going into the foods that we eat in our daily life, these are the things we want to be taking in as much as we can. And that's why we're all here in circle because we're working so hard uh, in, in community to bring this knowledge back as part of the way that we close out that ceremony. There are traditions and these are some of what I, you know, I, I have a whole eight week class devoted just to teaching folks about all of these different ways that we can do that. But one of them I'm gonna leave you with tonight because it is, it is really coming strongly to me based on what Phoenix shared and what others have shared in the comments is that we have special baths that are done after birth and these can also be done at any time in in uh, our original teachings we are supposed to be doing these medicinal baths at least every uh, season and where i live we have four seasons so we have four baths that we're supposed to be taking every year but even if we can only do it one time we really need to call upon the spirit and the power and the medicine that water gives us in our culture we say water is life you know, water, it, water is the foundation of who we are as Anishinaabe people. And that's true for a lot of indigenous folks as well. So the more we can get in the water and let that water be all in our hair, all everywhere that it needs to go. And, and one of my teachers, she just says it straight. <laughs> she has no like, She's like, it just is what it is. She, she doesn't let these colonial concepts of shame, you know, change the way that she talks about things. So she even says that we need to really uh, let that water go everywhere. You know, it, it go into your, uh, your vulva area, go over your scar. It has to be over your breasts. Anywhere that you felt violated from your experience, you want to call upon that water for healing. And that can be done now. You know, you could go do that tomorrow. Um, you want to set the intention for yourself, what you're asking of that spirit to come and help you. Um, you know, be mindful when you sit to just even to take a drink that you can pray into that water and, and pray for that healing to come and, and reach all of those parts in you um, that you felt were damaged during that uh, birthing ceremony. And that can, that can be what helps bring you back and help to bring your spirit back and help to, uh, you know, fill in all of those spots that got broken up due, due, due to the difficulties that you faced. Hi, Sonia. Um, oh, sorry. oh, sorry. Yeah, there's, I, I uh, just to... What? Oh, there's just, just two people to... on the chat, uh, Jessica mm -hmm. and Elizabeth. So um, after you, yeah, okay, cool, thanks. Okay, so I just wanted to say how, how, Oh, I just love the way this is coming together. How Rayanne was talking about it's our traditional food that ground us. And Phoenix, you have innately been eating your traditional food, growing your traditional food. You've been grounding yourself all this time. And I think that your heart is leading you on the path back to your Apache ways. And I like the, the strength of pride that you have in your knowledge of the, the fruits and the plants and the medicines. I, you know, you're incredible. Uh, your presentation was incredible. And, uh, and so I think that you have been somehow gathering the pieces from the, from the ethers, is that what they're called? And, and making them, putting them in, in, inside of you again. And, just keep doing that, sweetheart, because um, we all we all need that. You know, when you grow, I think then a lot of us also grow a little bit more. You know, because watching you and and listening to you and Rayanne and Desiree and Brooke, I can feel what young people have to teach us elders. You know, and so I feel enriched. Um, 
and it's marvelous. You know, when you think about the education, how it goes both ways, um, you know, how you guys teach me, how my grandchildren teach me, um, and then, and then, you know, then we get to teach sometimes too. Yeah. But anyway, so I just wanted to, to say that Phoenix, because I think you've been doing a lot maybe innately or knowingly to heal yourself and to ground yourself in your traditional ways. I just wanted to say that much. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you so um, much, Christina. I'm going to open up the mic to Jessica and then after that, Elizabeth and um, Kaulani. I hope I'm not um, messing up your name, but please forgive me if I, I mispronounced it. So Jessica first. Okay, hi. <clears throat> Thank you for um, letting me join your group. Um, I don't know. I stumbled upon this group through um, another group, and I don't know if it's supposed to be Apache because my heritage is actually Comanche, not Apache. But um, I feel like a, due to the geographic um, closeness, there's a lot of similarity. Um, I don't know if you feel the same, but... Um, I lost all access to uh, my community, my elders, my family, my traditions, my everything, because my family got sucked into um, a cult, a Christian cult in the United States. And mm, there was a systematic destroying of our culture and everything related to it um, that might sound spiritistic. So, so many things that you have mentioned, um, I, I feel like when I'm able to process it, I'll probably cry because there's things that my grandmother uh, did tell me that were passed on the traditional foods, the practices, their births, oh. what they did. Um, they did home birth and breastfeeding when nobody else in the United States was because most of them were still giving birth at home in my family. Um, but there's so much that was lost and there's so much that like they said, oh, we don't do that anymore. We burned these things because they were spiritistic. And I feel like so much was robbed from me. And now that I left this cult, um, my family is also shunning me. So now I have no living bridge to anybody in my culture. Um, I'm completely alone and I'm doing birth work. And so many things you've said, like I knew them deep down. I knew them like intuitively um, things, teachings that I just knew. Um, and it's so validating and amazing to connect. And I hope that it's okay for me to adopt you as sisters and elders because I don't have mine. Um, and I need this connection for my kids. And I thought about writing my grandmother and saying like, hey, um, can I just please just, just for posterity, like ask you some questions. Um, but she may not answer me. So, um, but from the birth work, so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I, I hope that this happens regularly and, uh, and that I can continue to um, just have my, my instincts and my inner knowing validated and, and learn and be able to connect from your wisdom. Um, in terms of Phoenix and your birth, I wanted to tell you as a labor nurse, I mean, sometimes I think like my family needs me more, whatever. I'm just, I'm not gonna be a nurse anymore. I'm just gonna stay at home and like raise the kids and the chickens and whatever. But I feel such a visceral horror at how you were treated. Um, just the disrespect in, in every way that you were spoken to in, in a place whenever you should have been treated for the sacred space that you and your body and your daughter were. And it was, I'm, I feel like your instincts did speak to you every step of the way. You knew it wasn't time to induce. You knew whenever it was time to call it, you knew every step of the way you were connected into the ether with your daughter and what needed to be happening and you were disrespected. But, you know, it's knowing that your treatment was appalling, um, the validation and how it should have been. Um, you know, I think, and, and I don't know in terms of like official teaching with ceremony, but a lot of times like imagining back, like, holding your daughter, no matter how old she is now, even if she's a couple of years old, I'm sorry if I missed her age, but holding her in like close to your physical body where your spirits connect and imagining how you would have liked to have gone 
either saying it or just holding her and imagining it and walking through the steps of how it should have gone. Um, it's never too late to like close, close that door between your hearts on how you should have been introduced to each other, what your introduction should have been because it was stolen from you. It wasn't a failing on her instincts or yours. It was taken from you. So um, I'm glad that you're able to share it. You know, I hope that, you know, through the sharing, you find closure and peace. And also a lot of other women are called to support other women through birth. Um, so this will happen to fewer people um, because it is a vulnerable space that a lot of times you do need another person to say, you shouldn't have to fight your own battles when you're giving birth. Um, and I, I hope that a lot of hearts are reached through your um, being able to be vulnerable um, and yeah. telling that. And, and uh, so many other people will be, will be called to, to service to birth work and be called out of just the lull of our own lives, which is, I think, what I was trying to say in my stream of consciousness is like, it's so easy to just fall into the lull of our own lives and our own families. But um, we, we have to be passionate about this together. So this doesn't happen to more women the way it happened to you. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Um, real quick on your, your family story. Thank you for sharing your family story. It's very, very similar to mine with really? the whole broken family dynamic thing. Yeah, because my family, uh, they became very Christian and without you know calling out the, the branch of Christianity, you know, oh, I wonder if it's the same one, but yeah, that's Go what ahead. I was wondering, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, and they did, you know, I did learn some things. I learned, I learned how to cook things and I learned how to grow certain things and right. I learned certain things we do. And, you know, they, you know, I learned how to act like, like in they, like I learned how to act Apache, but I didn't learn no spirituality. I same. Same. I was taught some stories, but there was no, like, I don't know, now as an adult, I have to find out which stories I'm allowed to tell right now, because, it, because they were just told to me, and I, with no, no regard to when or, or, you know, to the protocols that are around those stories, I was just told them, so I don't know, I just know right. I know stories, and then if I start talking to somebody about it, they'll say, no, 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 not right now, then I'm like, okay, so what stories am I allowed to talk about right now, you know what I mean, like, but... I got to find out the hard way from trial and error and and kind of feeling bad like like I feel like I'm stepping like I'm in, like I'm insulting or, or doing a, something offensive because because I was taught certain things but I don't know when's the right time like the right protocol well now it's all the filter thing. yes yes and I yes and I don't know if this is true across the board but there is this like concept of like uh there the elder respect is still there um, yes. It's just been transplanted into this new culture. So all the same rules about not quite speak when you're spoken to, but it very much is like it could be rude if you bring it up at the wrong time or out of context. And since they no longer see the value in some of these things, since they've replaced them with Christianity, um, mm -hmm. like, so, yeah, I totally feel you like it's going to be very hard. So that's why I feel like in my case, uh, so my family hasn't spoken to me in four years since I left this cult, but I'm going to make a list of questions not bring up religion at all and just like just pray that something in them just for posterity like will will tell me what they remember because this is when they're dead it's over you know like my if aunt they will answer, and mine will if not. they will answer yeah if mine, they will answer they will say i forgot they will either say probably and you can't tell you can't tell if they actually forgot or if they if they're saying they forgot yep but if i've gotten that but, line but they're also elder, you know, so you can't, you can't push you can't. them like too much. Mm -hmm. No, you can't. Nope. They said they forgot. That's it. Leave it. Like they said they're forgot. And, yeah. You can't be like, yeah, right. Or act. Right, so right. no, I, and that's, I, so I need these elders, you know, like I, I hope that yes, the, the inner tribal space is secure and that, you know, everything, um, because this is the only place I'm going to get it now. And I'm so grateful. Mm -hmm. I'd like to turn the mic over to um, Elizabeth now. Oh, uh. hi, sorry. I actually have to leave here in just like one quick second. Um, but I just, 
just want to say thank you so much to everyone um, for creating this space and everything that you've shared today. I just really appreciate being part of it. Um, so much like Phoenix and Jessica, my my family, we so um, my background is Anishinaabe, Little Traverse Bay, Bangawa, and um, we've lost so much um, because my grandmother was taken from her family and she was told her family was dead. And um, so she was raised in an orphanage and um, told that, you know, she would, typical, you know, residential school stories, right? Like she grew up thinking everything Anishinaabe about her was bad and evil and um, she owed the nuns for saving her from it. So I don't, I'm not able to learn from her. Um, all I could do at this point is try to heal what happened to her. And I, I apologize, I don't remember who was saying it, but um, as I've learned and reconnected back to our heritage and to our traditions, it's been so validating because I have felt so much of what I was doing intuitively. I'm finding mm -hmm. out traditions. I've learned so much from Rayanne. Um, so I'm always glad when, you know, Rayanne, it's always great to see you and thank you always for everything you share. And I, um, you know, I feel like the ancestors definitely put you in my path, um, you know, to help me learn. And, um, and I've been doing, so I've, I really started exploring and trying to, to restore a lot of this when I had my first baby. Um, and we had a really difficult uh, breastfeeding, birth and breastfeeding. And, and I felt like so much of that came from, from me not understanding the ceremony that we were going through um, and really fighting it. And, um, but anyway, so since then I've been working in, as a lactation professional, I started learning um, and I, so that I could help other people. And I just wanted to, like I said in my comment, um, Phoenix, I wanted to really lift you up, you and your baby. I just heard what I was hearing so much over and over was all the ways that the system was trying to break you and you didn't mm -hmm. break. You are resilient and you are amazing and strong and your baby is too. And that's what I heard in your story. And Thank I just, you. sorry, I like get all choked up on these ones. So, um, you know, and it's something that I gently try to reframe for folks when I hear, when I hear us talk about our babies as lazy. Um, the one thing I just want to say is that your baby, your baby wasn't lazy. She was so strong. She was, she was smart and they are so grounded in that wisdom and that survival. Um, and uh, like Brooke was saying, babies uh, before 37 weeks generally don't have a strong suck reflex and their muscles are not strongly developed for, um, for really mm -hmm. effective latching. And your baby, she knew that and she did what she had to do to survive and that's brilliant. And you guys are an amazing pair. I can just see it. And <laughs> you, you know, the ancestors are with you and you know, we're, all, we're all in this, you know? Yep. And Thank I apologize. You. Now I have to like bounce out. Uh, <laughs> I'm on the West Coast and I got to go pick up my baby. Um, oh. I just appreciate you all so much. Oh, thank you so much for your words, Elizabeth. Those were wonderful. That was really a good, um, what is it called? Well, you had good words and you spoke them. And I, I know that um, we've all learned something from that. Thank you. Miigwech. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Bye. 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 Uh, so our, our next person, uh, Kayulani. 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 Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Kayulani. Yes. Um, uh -huh. Aloha. I'm here from Hawaii and this is my first time joining. So I'm not, I, I'm hoping I'm also okay being in this group if it, or if it's yeah. just a, is it, I, I thought it was indigenous group, but um, I, I'm from Hawaii and um, we do birthing work over here. We have a nine week program for uh, Hawaiian couples to empower them to bring back all their cultural traditions in the birth and pregnancy and birth process. And um, so listening to people speak, you know, religion is something that we've struggled to with as um, if you look at it from an indigenous point of view, we had 40,000 gods, big and small, that represented all the elements. And so mm -hmm. when 
the white people brought in one more God, it wasn't that hard to just add another God to your cadre of gods that you, but if you look at from a Western point of view, then it became, you could only believe in one God. So just really, whether you're looking at it from an indigenous or a Western point of view kind of changes the way that you view religion and spirituality. But anyway, that what I really wanted to, and I'm sorry if I just, uh, this question is something that we always come up with when I'm listening to traditions is we plant our placenta and we usually do it with a tree that has a, um, like ulu, an ulu tree for us, ulu means to grow. So if you want your child to grow or kukui nut um, is enlightenment enlightenment or wisdom. So if you want your child to have those qualities, you plant the placenta with the tree. And so I'm just, I've heard also that Native American uh, cultures also do that. And so one of the things with us is we have some great uh, midwives that are non-Indigenous. And so the encapsulating of placenta is something that they do. And in all my research that I've done that, um, in times where you really need it, like if you know someone was, uh, you couldn't stop the bleeding or it was a, a serious matter, then you know that where you could take a piece of the placenta and eat it. We also have in our culture, uh, the allied dirt will stop that. But the encapsulating of the placenta, in my mind, is a much more uh, Western idea, and I'm just wondering if. Um, it, or is that something that you folks also do in your practice? Oh, what what is meant by um, encapsulating? Like putting it in pills. Well, it's not just it's putting oh. it in pills or it's throwing it. In, I've read things about putting it in, I don't know, a blender or cooking it afterwards. And I just know that traditionally, that wasn't something that was done. The eating of the placenta wasn't something we did. I have an answer so, for the uh, just this is the, oh sorry, this is like three people. Oh, this is an intertribal sorry. space, so we welcome people from indigenous backgrounds. We primarily yeah. focus on Turtle Island, but we also have indigenous South Americans, and we also um, welcome uh, the Pacific and and other uh, indigenous nations. So just please feel free to share uh, with your communities or. This is an open space. Um, uh, so um, that answers the first question. I think I had like three questions. But uh, in <laughs> my community, we do bury it, but we also keep the umbilical cord. But some of us lose it, which is bad. But um, <laughs> my mom lost mine. It's in a book somewhere. It's in one of these old albums somewhere in the house. <laughs> yeah, that's the same for us. We bury our placenta, but we keep the umbilical cord. And you could... Um, if you wanted to, if your family was connected with maybe the ocean or the volcanoes or the forest, then you would find a safe place to bury it there. Uh, the Lakotas, uh, if it's a, if it's the umbilical cord of a female, um, it's sewn up into a turtle, and if it's an umbilical cord of a male, it's sewn up into uh, a lizard, and and then usually they keep they keep they keep those things because they're made out of, usually out of rawhide, you know, but beautifully designed and beaded and everything. And then the umbil umbilical cord is sewn into that. Okay. So on the encapsulation of the, the placenta, that is a modern colonial construct. As far as my placenta, my, my mom, what she did with my placenta, as from what I know, she kept it. She kept it and she kept the umbilical cord. Now, what did my mom do? As you, because my mother is the is the Apache, my mother's, you know, what did she do with it? I just know she kept it in the album. I remember seeing it when I was growing up, at least definitely the umbilical cord was on one page and inside of that fat old album. But I don't know what she did with what like did she, I mean, even when I cut my hair before, she would have my hair cut sometimes. She kept all my hair yeah. and she put it in a box, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, teeth. See, I was born with all of my teeth. Um, oh, I had, wow. well, I had what, eight on the top and six on the bottom or something like this. I came out like this. Uh, they kept my teeth. Um, well, let's see what else. But the kukui nut tree, we planted, my, my papa, they planted, they planted, he planted trees for me, one for me and one for my older sister. And he lived, he, he lived in Eva at the time when we were little. 
and but I'm trying to remember what tree it was. Can't remember. Maybe it was. I know one was a cuckoo nut, but it was it for me or my older sister. I don't know. I have a confession. Huh. Because I'm in New York City, so I'm not back in boarding again, and my son is half Wakota. I still yes. have my placenta frozen in the refrigerator. We'll find out what to do with it. Do you guys want to see? <laughs> Can I show and tell it? Should I? No? No? All right. Okay. That's Wait a right. second. Let me no. talk about the, the encapsulation, the pills. So what I'm happened gonna... with these white people or these Haole people, as we say in Hawaii, these white people, what they did was they were like, oh, look, all these, all these native people everywhere. They're like, they like, they eat their placenta and like animals eat the placenta too. So, you know, it's like spiritual and stuff. So let's do it, but we don't want to do it like that. So we're going to dry it and we're going to grind it and put it in capsules to take. So, so basically, actually, for, in my eyes, the way I was raised and stuff, I would see it as they disconnected. Because when you're eating your placenta, it's uh, it's still alive. It's still got that energy in, or as they say, you know, it's still got mana. It's still got energy inside and, and stuff. It's still alive, you know? It's part of you. And if you're going to eat a piece of it after or whatever, and you eat it as is, you know, that's that connection. But when you when you capsule it and you powder it and you dry it and stuff, you killed it. Like you 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 disconnected it from the world because you you put it through this process. This is how I I, I see it. You know, you you got rid of that. You so they so basically, it's like they take this thing. Oh look, nice little native thing. Let's find out what we can do with it. And then like mm -hmm. they made capsules and ran with it. They marketed Ooh. it as a cool thing. You know, the I thing is, is that I haven't heard of any other native cultures that ate their placenta. And so I'm not sure where it came, and the, which is the reason I asked on this forum is all these um, indigenous uh, sisters are here. But so I, but I feel though that what I know from my culture is that we've forgotten the medicine or we've forgotten the ways of our culture that, um, mm -hmm. that do the things that people are taking the placenta for. So to stop the bleeding, to give you, you know, they give you more energy, whatever. And so what we've had to do is to bring back the medicines from our culture that bring back the spirit and the energy and the physical health of the mother after she gives birth. And so we don't need to do that. And that's how we are telling people not to do it. In our culture, the word for placenta, one of the words for it is honua, which also means earth. So that tells us that this goes back into the earth and that feeds the earth, which just feeds the people. And it's just this cycle that you create. And so I get, I was really looking to see, cause I wanted to make sure in my mind that, you know, I really was understanding that there really aren't indigenous tribes that ate their placenta. That's just not something we did. Not the whole thing. A, a colonized thing that has come afterwards. Yeah, I don't think so. Not the whole thing. I've never heard of somebody eating the whole placenta. I've heard of people eating like a piece of it or something or other. Some people, I'm, tr I'm trying to remember who it was or where they came from, but I've heard them say that they eat some of it like after because they're like, mm -hmm. some. It's, it had something to do with their people's ceremony, like their connection, their ceremony. or And, and also it's supposed to make her feel strong, get stronger and you know, prepare her for being a mother now that the baby's out, you know? Mm -hmm. I've heard that. And I've heard, um, I've heard across the world, I've heard some people from Africa, you know, eating that or, or different people from, um, where is that place? It's in, it's in, it's in Southeast Asia. Where is it? Was it Indonesia? I've heard of some Indonesians, tribal Indonesians eating, eating it, but not, the, like I said, not the whole thing. I think that, you know, Somebody, somebody must have seen it and been like, oh, they're eating a piece of it. So maybe they're eating the whole thing, you know? And then, cause they, that's what they do. They see something that, that an indigenous person somewhere is doing, and then they just kind of homogenize it with all the indigenous people in the world. And then they kind of just do something extra. Like, instead of just eating a piece of it, they're gonna eat the whole thing, you know? So th that's kind of, yeah, it seems colonial to me, definitely, like somebody, well, the other somebody thought that, they can make money from it. Mm, that's what. 
the other thing that we face here is that you always buried it on a piece of your land. And as more indigenous people are losing the rights to the very own land that they live on, then they no longer yeah. have the spaces. And so that's something that we're also faced with is we teach our couples to bury their placenta in some place that they'll be able to care for the plant. But when you're living in an apartment or you no longer own land, then you have to seek out some place that's going to be undisturbed that you know that you would have access to. So that's just another modern constraint on one of our cultural practices. For in there, I know we also bury the placenta, okay? But um, for but the ceremony that's required for that, like the prayers that are said and stuff, I don't know them. I was mm -hmm. raised by very Christian, like, like, like uh, I think Jessica was saying, really Christian family, you know, they, they taught me some things and left out, left out others. And, you know, I don't know what those are, but I know we bury it. And the umbilical cord, we bury, we bury it. Okay, thank you everybody. Thanks for your feedback. This has really been a very enlightening um, panel discussion this evening. And, <laughs> and Phoenix, I'm amazed that that as as a speaker, you know, you were able to present all of the all of the um, the solutions and and um, by using the the tinctures and the different kinds of things that you spoke about uh, during your presentation. And did you did you start? Did you already know how to do all that right after your baby was born? And did you do that for yourself or no? Phoenix. Oh, I thought Am it was for Rayhan. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I thought it was for Rayhan and not me. Oh. Well, <laughs> no, I learned. Okay. So after I had my baby, what I knew I should do was I needed to eat. There's this seed. It's, it's like, a, it's a spicy type of seed, but when you wet it, it becomes like jelly. And I'm trying to remember it off the top of my head, but I forgot. But you make like a soup out of it and it's, it, it balance. Oh. Oh, darn it. I just forgot it. Um, it. It balances your hormones after you give birth. So you drink that as a soup all the time, like, like for at least 10 days or so after you have the baby in it. And it helps you to pass everything. And it helps to strengthen your womb so that it can go back to its size. And I think it's, I think it's called spicy cress in, in common, in common words, uh, lepidium sativum. Um, but it's, it's cress seeds, I think. And um, yeah, so it, it balances the hormones in your body and stuff. And the other thing was the senna. I knew I should take senna because um, it's gonna, with the C-section is really hard to pass gas or, or use a toilet. So I, I took the senna and um, you know, certain things I, I, I don't know, let me see. A lot of what I knew is because of what I learned as an, uh, you know, going to school with for herbalism and the, but the other things like um, like umbilical cord and stuff, I know what's I know what's generally what's supposed to be done with it, but no, I didn't do it. I still have my daughter's umbilical cord. They didn't give me no placenta, but I have her umbilical cord. Um, I think I think they're taking the placenta, as somebody said, I can't remember who, to drain the blood for um, for stem cells, stem cell blood. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's why they keep your placenta to take to take from it. And which, by the way, I don't, I don't agree with that. I think that um, they should, it should be a requirement to, to let the mother decide, like, to sign off on that because, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. what do you mean you're going to take my daughter's stem cell blood from her? You know what I mean? That's, that's not for you. She should have had the rest of that, you know? But anyway, you, you all know I had a bad experience anyway. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to think, what else did I know? What did I know? that I was taught. Aside from the bone broth, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I'm always I'm always eating bone broth. And the bone broth, yes, you put you can put fennel seeds in it and and the fenugreek and you can put the the cress seeds in in the bone soup when you boil your bones also to help with the milk and to help strengthen the womb and push everything out. Um let's see. And it helps a child pass gas too when you put fennel in, fennel in the in the bone soup. Remember how I was making that? You know, so um, uh, 
well, I was gonna say when the baby's having gas, like it helps a lot to like eat things that that'll pass to the baby. Um, trying to think what else did I know already? Maybe culturally, that's basically it. I know that there, I know I wasn't, I'm not supposed to cut her hair until she's at least four years old. And even then we have, I know there's supposed to be a ceremony for that on, mm. on that birthday, but I have to, I have to ask my knowledge holders to get that knowledge because I, I didn't get it from my family. I just know general things it's supposed to happen, but what's supposed to happen and what prayers, I don't know because I didn't get that from my family. Um, but my ex-husband, my, my daughter's father, he, uh, he did let his, um, his mother cut her hair you know, which made me very upset because you're not supposed to cut her hair at all. But then again, he's not natives at all. So he just, his mom was like, no, it'll make her hair grow fast. I said, her hair's already growing. I said, you don't let your mom cut her hair. Like if there's, she's already growing up with a lot of your culture anyway. You know, what is she gonna have from her mom? Don't cut her hair, do not cut her hair. Next thing you know, they cut her hair, but he gave me her hair in a baggie and I was like, well, thank you for giving me that, you know? Mm -hmm. But ever mm -hmm. since then he, you know, they didn't cut her hair again, but I feel like they were imposing themselves over me to like, to make their culture more important than mine. That's how it felt like anyway. Mm -hmm. So maybe if people are in this, in, in, in mixed, mixed relationships and stuff, you know, you have a, a, a significant other who's not native, you know, you, maybe you might be experiencing that kind of, um, cultural differences, you know, or microaggressions, actually, I think it's, it's like, it's like colonialism inside of your relationship, actually, when, when they decide that their culture is more important than yours, and then they have to push, you know, push it on you and their, and, and the baby, you know. Well, interestingly, so Rayanne has an interesting comment um, that she put in the chat. Rayanne, would you maybe share with us what you put in the chat just now? That's a really good segue from what Phoenix just said. Yeah, we're talking about the placenta and how a lot of us have, le you know, left our placentas behind, uh, you know, as as we were born ourselves, and as we may have had our children and we didn't know better, or, or we thought that we weren't able to. But one of my direct teachers always reminds us that we have here in the United States, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1978, which does protect our religious practices through federal law. So um, she reminds us that we can always pull that out if we need to, if an uh, institution is not allowing us to take home what is a piece of our, our body. It's part of our spiritual practices. So uh, memorize that. American Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1978. And, you know, if, if a lot of hospitals these days, they are more accommodating. Um, but I have heard now that due to COVID, there's, uh, we're kind of backsliding on being able to bring home our placentas. And all of that being said, the last thing that I'll say is that and nothing is nothing is forever. And so we lost a ceremony or we didn't get to do it or it, it turned out, you know, to be mass backwards than how we would have wanted it to be. That's okay. We can always go back and fix things that have happened in the past and we can always undo, you know, like we can always do it again. We can always um, retrieve the spirit of that placenta, even if it was left behind, even if it was destroyed, even if even if we ate it, <laughs> we can, um, you know, there are ceremonies that vary by tribe to tribe and nation to nation, but if people want more information on how that can be done, I'm just planting that seed for you tonight so that you know that you can go back and do that. And I would also recommend that if you've been keeping it in the freezer that you, you find out what to do with that as soon as you can because um, it can leave like a cold effect on your body and, and of the baby to have it in a cold environment. So. Um, it, it's okay to keep it in there until you know what to do with it, but I would plant the seed for you to ask around and see what needs to be done and also pray on it because you may never get the answer from your own family. You don't wait for them. Yeah. Do your own prayer now so that the creator and your ancestors can speak to you directly as to what needs to be done. And that's always correct to do. 
Mm-hmm. Bravo, yeah. Can I talk about breast milk? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so breast milk, we were talking the other day on the on the First Foods um, Facebook room about breast milk. And uh, we were talking about different recipes or think, ways that it could be used and stuff like that. And um, uh, Kayahani was saying something about how the breast milk, um, you know, it, it, the, the breast responds to the needs of the child. If it needs, if the child is low on sugar, the next thing you know, the, the breast milk will be coming out with more sugar and stuff like this. And I said, that's because the breast milk is part of your spirit. It's, it's alive, like it has your, your spirit. It's alive, it, so it can it can sense that because it's alive. And I don't remember where I learned that from. Actually, I just remember that the breast milk is alive. It's a it's like an extension of your spirit, you know. And that's why when you're it's like when your spirit's touching your baby, it's feeling your baby and knows and your your baby spirit. It knows exactly what what's supposed to be provided. And even it goes the same way. Even if you're if you're pumping and then and then feeding with a bottle because I noticed that with my daughter, like some of my milk will come out with a lot of fat. And then that was when in the beginning when she was first born, it had a lot of fat. And I think it's cause she was premature and she had like no meat on her bones and it was trying to pump her up, you know? And then sometimes it was very watery and sometimes um, it was it was not, you know? So like that's even even if I wasn't breastfeeding I don't know how it, it just knew that my baby needed those things, except for that it that it's an extension of my spirit, that it, that it's that it's spirit. Oh yeah, awkward silence. Sometimes that happens. But yeah, so I was talking about that because uh, I found out through my lactation specialist that um, what's interesting with the breast, the the parent-child exchange of breast milk, is that not only will it respond to any uh, infections going on in the body, it'll actually produce more antibodies or any viral infections or things like that, um, natural antibiotics but also macronutrients like your fats, your lipids and stuff like that, your, your starches and your sugars and, and um, not really fiber, but uh, those macronutrients, let's say on Monday, you're producing an ounce and on Tuesday, you're producing an ounce, but the only, but on Monday, somehow through the saliva and, and, and like probably Phoenix's most accurate answer is that, you know, it's, and also somewhat of Rayanne's answers, the ceremony, the spirit, this this creative energy that we have, the breast milk will, let's say they're low on fat in, in Phoenix's case, it will, let's say it was like 20% on Monday. By Tuesday, it will jump up to like 30, 40%. These are just like made up numbers, but for the same ounce of milk. So it's a, it's talking. This milk is alive. It's talking to the child and speaking directly to the child's needs. Um, so I always thought that was extremely fascinating when I learned more about breast milk and, and yesterday we had a really cool conversation talking about that on the, uh, breast milk chat. But we are on, in our last probably minute, we went over a little bit. So I'm going to hand it back over to Kristenia and also to the, our panelists, our community members, you know, our teacher matrix that we had today and also Desiree for any last minute words and uh, last wrap ups after that. Okay. Well, I, I would really like to thank each one of you the panelists uh, for being here and participating today. And uh, like I said before, it's, it's really been an eye opener and uh, I appreciate everything that you've shared. And I appreciate each, each one of us sharing our vulnerabilities and our strengths. And I see a lot of strength in you, Phoenix. I see a lot of strength in you finding your way back, just allowing your spirit to guide you. I think it's going to take you in a good direction. And Kailani, it's really nice to meet you. I have a lot of family in Hawaii. So um, that's all I have to say. But just thank you for allowing me to, is it called moderate? 
group. I, I really enjoy it. I really, I really enjoy interacting with each panel member. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, thank you from me as well. Thank you to everyone who tuned in on our Facebook Live. This is our very first public panel. Um, and public anything that we've done, we've been pretty, um, you know, just a little protective wanting to keep our class in our group. But since today is Women's Equality Day, we wanted to make sure that it was accessible as possible to folks. Um, and also to that point, we're working on some accessibility things. So um, that will be something to look forward to. Uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in on our class and kept that chat going. We appreciate you. We welcome you to come back same time, same place every week. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Okay. Everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you, Ryan. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>